Casey and everyone else. Uh, that was just wonderful. Um, I met Bill before the service, and I said, you know, I just have great admiration for anyone like David or Bill who can write a song, sing it, and it be good. Like, I'm pretty sure I could write a song, but I don't know that it would be any good. I don't know if you'd recognize it as a song. I wanted to uh, make up for an error I made last week, which was to not mention the Advent devotional. Hopefully you've been picking it up online or on our Facebook page. Um, you can go to our website, which is fumcocala.org, and it'll be right there on the front page. You just click on that, go to the today's date or whatever date it is you're reading, and it'll be right there. But there are copies in the back if you'd like a hard copy. These were several members of our church um, that have written a devotional each day for you throughout Advent. So if you missed the first week, you can always go back and reread it. It's, they're not very long, and I wanted to make sure you had that. It's just meant to be a tool in the toolbox to help Advent become something more meaningful to you and to all of us um, during this time. Would you allow me to pray with you before we begin the message? Holy God, we thank you. We thank you for your word and for the ability we have to go back to it time and time again. And God, as we prepare the way for the Christ child to come in our lives and in the life of our church, God, we ask that it would be something that becomes more and more meaningful to us in this time. Help us, God, to be able to live out your word so that the world around us might catch a glimpse of who you are and how much you love them. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. I wonder if you've ever been in a situation where you thought there wasn't a way out. Where you kind of wondered if there was ever going to be an answer or ever going to be a solution or a resolution to the thing that you thought just wasn't going to have a way. Well, I read several years ago about Chris Gursky. Chris Gursky was a tourist from America that went over to Europe, and he was in the Swiss Alps, and he wanted to go on a hang gliding tour. And when he went to get hooked up with this guide and pilot, or whatever you call a hang glide person, uh, when he got to go hooked up, they went to go take off, and immediately Chris Gursky realized, and the pilot realized, the pilot had not hooked him to the hang glider. I have a picture of it right there. He's four, almost quickly 4,000 feet off the ground in the Swiss Alps, hanging on for his dear life. And he was only hanging on to the guide by his right arm and the bar by his left arm. And in his own words, he says, at one point I looked down and I saw the scenery down there. It was all the treetops changing colors and the little farmhouses, and I actually thought to myself, that is beautiful. I am going to die there. <laughs> well, he had to hold on for almost four minutes, and when they got to the point where they were about to land, he could not hold on anymore. They were about 20 feet off the ground, and he just let go and dropped to the ground. He ended up tearing his bicep muscle and several of the tendons, I guess, in his left arm, and then he broke and fractured his right wrist upon hitting the ground. The weirdest thing to me is that after surviving such a terrible incident where he didn't think there was going to be a way out, he thought that was it for him, he actually ended up going back later and doing it again and making sure he was hooked in. And he's, there's an interview with him saying that it was absolutely wonderful. There is no way on God's green earth that I would ever go back and do that again if that happened the first time, if I did it the first time, right? Well, maybe you've never faced a death-defying moment like Chris Gursky. Maybe your situations where you don't see a way out or feel like there might not be a way out are a little more subtle, a little more down to earth, maybe like struggling in a relationship, maybe not seeing a way out for a difficult situation at work or, or in your family, or maybe it's not seeing a way out of financial hardship. Whatever it may be, there come times in life where we look 
straight at the problem we're facing, and we wonder, is there a way through this? I remember when I was in my 20s, I had sworn off dating because I just didn't see the point. Like, I was trying to find a spouse, and everybody else just wanted to go to the clubs, so to speak. I don't know if that's what you say nowadays, but that's what we did back then. And I just swore it off, and I said, you know what? If it's going to happen, it's going to have to be a God thing because, like, I, I don't have enough money and not enough. To, I don't want to do that. And it took about six years for me to say, okay, okay, God, I know I said I'd swear it off and it had to be up to you, but it's been like six years, God. Like, what's going on here? And I started praying a little harder, started thinking a little harder about it, and, and I just decided I truly was going to put it in God's hands. Because only God could figure this out. Like, I, I, I have a keen awareness of my own abilities. And in this regard, I was not thinking that this was going to happen by my power alone. Or it would have happened already. And so I put it in God's hands. And I've told you the end of the story. It's, you know, I met Debbie several weeks later. And within a couple of months of dating, I knew that this was God's answer to what I had been praying about. I also was thinking about it this week in terms of took a youth group hiking in um, Tennessee one time and we went into a cave. It was actually a, you know, a national park type cave where they had guides and everything and they took us down into this deep recess of the cave and then they had us sit on some of the rocks and the guide started talking about how the natural condition of that cave would be and it would be dark like we they had lights on for us to see the formations and whatnot but it would be dark and so they said they were going to turn the lights off and they turned the lights off and you could not see the hand in front of your face it was so dark and I got to thinking if they left them that way surely we would die because I don't think we could find our way out it was so so dark and sometimes life circumstances feel like that they really do. Last week we talked about hope. This week we're going to talk about love. Because we need the hope that we have in preparation for Christ's coming, the hope that God is going to save us, rescue us, send us the Messiah. And yet sometimes we maybe don't focus on the fact that it's love that makes that happen. When we're in those dark moments where we don't see a way forward, it's terrible, it's no fun, it's really gut-wrenching. But what it does is lead us to seek help. The good news is there's no situations that God has not seen. There's no situation you can get yourself into or I can get myself into that God cannot help you in a way forward. You see, the history of God's people is to get ourselves in trouble. The history of God's people is to move away from what God is leading us to do and then find us ourselves in a place where we can't get ourselves out and then cry for help that God would find a way and make a way. And the absolute good news of all of Scripture is that God will make a way where there seems to be no way. I love the story of John the Baptist because John the Baptist's whole purpose for being on this planet was to prepare the way for the Messiah. After 400 years of silence from no prophets, from the people wondering if there really could ever be a way forward, even though God had made a way previously, was there ever going to be a way forward and was there ever going to be a Messiah? And towards the end of the first chapter of Luke, we have this wonderful poem, prayer, song, if you will, by Zechariah, John the Baptist's dad. He's just been born, and he writes this long song, if you will, or psalm about his son. And towards the end, he says these words, starting in verse 76 of Luke chapter 1. He says, You, child, will be called a prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare his way. You will tell his people how to be saved through the forgiveness of their sins. Because of our God's deep compassion, the dawn from heaven will break upon us to give light to those who are sitting in darkness and in the shadow of death, to guide us on the path of peace. 
This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I'm, I'll just be straightforward with you. This just came to my mind. It's probably a Holy Spirit thing, and there's probably someone who needs to hear this. But dads, if you have a son in particular, say some kind of similar words over your son. Whether he hears it or not, but it would be really great if he hears it at some point in his life. Where you say something wonderful about what God is going to do in your son's life. Whether you see it or not. Remember, Zechariah had this wonderful notion of how his son would be. And yet, his son, when he grows up, wears camel's hair and eats locusts. And probably had really long hair, too. And probably Zechariah was like, what is going on with this boy? But he still spoke these words of blessing over his son. Now I want to look at, there's one translation for verse 78 that has it read this way. It says, excuse me, it says, Because the heart of our God is full of loving kindness for us, a light from heaven will shine on us. It says, Because the heart of our God is full of loving kindness for us. The light of heaven will shine on us. What I hope that we'll wrestle with this week on this second week of Advent is that the nature of love is to find a way. The nature of love, or you could say the nature of God, is to find a way. You remember John chapter 3, verses 16 and 17, where it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever would believe in him would have eternal light, not perish, but have eternal light. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but he sent him into the world to save it. You see, the nature of God is to find a way. And spoiler alert, that's what Advent is all about preparing the way for God to make a way where there seemed to be no way. And so in this scripture and in all of scripture, I see at least four ways that love manifests itself, four truths about God's love. The first thing is God sends the messenger. God sent John the Baptist. Zechariah said, you child will be called the prophet of the most high, For you will go before the Lord to prepare his way. A prophet like Elijah, a prophet who would come into the world and point towards Jesus, the one who is coming. God sends the messenger to announce that God has made a way. In all of the Old Testament, in all of Scripture, up till Jesus' coming, the prophets, the angels, the shepherds, John the Baptist, Point the way to Jesus. And I would add, in our day and age, you and I point the way to Jesus. God sends the messenger, and we are the messengers today. The second truth about God's love is that God explains the process. God doesn't just send the messenger to say, repent, turn towards God, and prepare the way of the one who's coming. No, God tells exactly how to do it. He says, Zechariah says of his son, you will tell his people how to be saved through forgiveness of their sins. John baptized people and said, repent and essentially turn towards Jesus, the one who is coming. Turn back to God. And we don't often like to use the word repent. Like I mentioned a few weeks ago, we're not going to go to Publix and talk, start talking to someone and they'll say, well, I'm not really that good with God. I don't go to go to church, and we don't say, well, could I lay my hand on you and pray for your repentance? I mean, it's just kind of a weird thing to do. But what you could do is say, well, God doesn't really like us to drift away from God and to do things that don't please God, and so we should really move away from that and move towards God. And it starts with us. God explains this process and wants for us to live by it first in order to prepare the way for Christ and to make a way for love in action. The third thing is that God's nature reveals the solution. The process is repentance and forgiveness, turning back to God, 
the nature of God is love, and it reveals that the solution is that the heart of God, full of loving kindness for you and for me, will send the light from heaven to shine on us. The light from heaven will shine on us. The important thing here is that when I said I want us to wrestle with the fact that the nature of love is to make a way or find a way, it really could read the nature of God is to find a way, to make a way for you and for me. There's two words that often in most translations are translated compassion. Our one that we read today, the Common English Bible says that God's heart of compassion But there's two Greek words that make up the word compassion in most translations. The first one, and I won't pronounce it for you because I'll butcher it, but it says it's the heart or the seat of the feelings or a person's inward nature. So they're literally talking about the deepest part of who God is, is the next word, which is eleus, which is pit or mercy or compassion. The very heart of God, God's deepest nature, is compassion or love for you and for me and for all the world. And so it could be translated more literally out of God's tender heart and merciful nature. The Son of Righteousness will be sent to shine on all of us. Which brings the fourth part of God's love, which is God makes a way in Jesus. That's what verse 79 is getting at, to give light to those who are sitting in darkness and in the shadow of death, to guide us on the path of pre... I can't speak today. Peace. Isaiah 9 verse 2 says, A great light will be seen by those walking in the darkness. This same imagery. In Matthew 4.16 it says, The great light will overcome the shadow of death under which the people have been living. I don't know about you, but sometimes our world and our life seems a little bit fatalistic, doesn't it? You can get to the end of your day and be thinking, what good did I do today? What good happened today? Where did I even think about God today? One of my favorite movies is The Princess Bride. Any, any Princess Briders in here? I love that type of humor, but I love the way that movie's written. And in that movie, there's the main character who is Wesley the farm boy, and and it turns out that he becomes this character, the Dread Pirate Roberts. And he's explaining the story, and it's been out a long time, so if you haven't seen it and that's a spoiler alert for you, sorry. (laughs) But in that movie, he explains that he was captured by the Dread Pirate Roberts but that the Dread Pirate Roberts eventually handed it over to him, and he retired. And so now he's the Dread Pirate Roberts. And he said in the movie, his quote is, every night on the ship, the Dread Pirate Roberts would say, good night, Wesley, good work, sleep well, I'll most likely kill you in the morning. And I share that quote because sometimes that's the way life feels. Like we get to the end of our day and we're like, okay, it was just another day. I'll go to bed, I'll get up, I'll do the same thing tomorrow. And I don't know whether it will be good or whether it will be bad. I don't know what's going to come my way. I don't know whether uh, something dramatic or traumatic is going to happen. And yet, love finds a way. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me won't walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Jesus said to Paul, I'm sending you to open their eyes. Then they can turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God and receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are made holy by faith in me. God makes a way in Jesus where there seems to be no way. In order to maybe drive that home a little bit, I've asked David if he would come and sing a song that has been around for a long time called God, has made a, God Will Make a Way, and I just invite you to listen to the words. If you know it, feel free to hum along or sing along.